Helen Serrett Memorial Lecture is an annual event to honor the memory of this most exceptional scientist. Dr. Campisi uh, received her PhD in biochemistry from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and completed her postdoc work training in cell cycle regulation at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. Uh, as an assistant and associate professor of the Boston University Medical School, she studied the role of cellular senescence in suppressing cancer and soon became convinced that senescent cells also contributed to aging. She joined the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as a senior scientist in 1991. In 2002, she started a second laboratory at the uh, Buck Institute uh, for Aging Research, which is where I met her. Uh, and uh, at both institutions, she established a broad program to understand the relationship between aging and age-related disease, with an emphasis on the interface between cancer and aging. Uh, she is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's received numerous awards for her research, including two merit awards from the National Institute on Aging, and awards from Allied Signal Corporation, Gerontological Society of America, the American Federation for Aging Research. Um, she's also recipient of the Longevity uh, Prize from the Ibsen Foundation, the Bennett Cohen Award from the University of Michigan, and the Schober Award from Halle University. Um, and she's re first recipient of the International Olaf Thon Foundation Prize in Natural Sciences and medicine. Um, she's currently serving uh, on advisory committees for Alliance for Aging Research, Progeria F uh, Research Foundation, and NIA's Intervention Testing Program. She's also an editorial board member for more than a dozen peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she is a scientific founder of Unity Biotechnology, a California-based company uh, focused on developing therapeutics for age-related pathologies. She has served on uh, scientific advisory boards for Geron Corporation, Sierra Bioscience, and Sangamo Biosciences. And we're delighted to have her here with us today. Welcome, Judy. Thank you, er oh, thank you Eric. Um, so it, this is my first time here. This is an absolutely beautiful location, and I want to thank Eric twice for inviting me first to talk to all of you, and then also to share this beautiful environment with me. Um, so I will start, uh, let's see if I can work this wrong way, nope, yeah. I'll start with a disclaimer, yes, I am a scientific founder of this company, but I'm not going to talk about anything um, the company does, but I will talk about the basic science that sort of gave rise to the development of this kind of company. So I see here almost a bimodal distribution of ages in the audience. <laughs> But I assume what you all have in common is you want to live a long life, yes? Yeah, everyone? Okay, good. So especially for the young people in the audience, uh, you should realize this is what you have to look forward to. <laughs> so this is obviously a partial list of the many diseases of aging. And you'll notice they're very different types of diseases, right? Neurodegeneration affecting neurons in the brain. Uh, heart disease, which affects multiple cell types in the heart, hearing loss, eye diseases, bone diseases, etc. So virtually all of the tissues in the body, all of the major organs. And what is amazing about all of these diseases is they all have the same trajectory. And by that I mean they're extremely rare in young people. And somewhere around the midpoint of the lifespan, all of these diseases rise increase with approximately exponential kinetics. So there are two possibilities. One, of course, is that all of these diseases, just by coincidence, happen to come up at the same time. Those of us who work on aging don't believe that's the case. I think I'm going to use my fingers. Um, we think that this is not a coincidence, and we think that's because all of these diseases are fuel driven by basic aging processes that affect all the tissues in the body. So this is still 
an assumption, but I think I'll convince you that we probably are correct, at least in part, about this idea that basic aging processes are driving all of these diseases. And therefore, this is a ripe way to think about in, um, intervening in these diseases by intervening in these basic aging processes. So um, if that's true, what we need to do is identify basic aging processes that are driving all of these diseases. And if we do that, of course, we're going to revolutionize medicine. We're no longer going to have a cardiologist who cares about your heart, but isn't going to look at your eyesight or care about your hearing or even care about whether you have a tumor. And the same thing is true for oncologists and the same thing is true for ophthalmologists, etc. So this is really kind of um, the cutting edge of biomedical research is to try to think about the diseases of aging as being a unitary force that is amenable to intervention at some basic level that's going to affect multiple tissues. So how do you go about identifying these basic aging processes? Obviously, there's lots of ways to do it. I'm going to tell you the way we did it, which was to focus on this disease here, cancer. So think about all of these diseases and you realize that what they all have in common is they're essentially loss of function diseases. That is, the tissue doesn't work as well as it should. And then there's this disease. I would be very hard pressed to call cancer a loss of function or degenerative disease. If you think about what a cancer cell needs to do to form a lethal tumor, it needs to acquire new things. It needs to gain new functions, and then it can go on and form the disease. And yet cancer follows the same trajectory as all of these degenerative diseases. So now, if you, if you buy that argument, then you can ask a somewhat simpler question. You can ask, is there a common biology between the degenerative diseases of aging and cancer? And that's the question that we started um, many, many years ago by asking. So we were very fortunate because at the time that I began thinking about this, cancer biology was much far advanced than aging biology. And so we went back and we asked, what have we learned from the 20 previous years of cancer research? And the cancer biologists have pretty much answered this question. So what we know about cancer, especially adult cancers, which is 90% of the cancers in the clinic, is that the first thing you need is mutations. And these are not the rare mutations that you hear about, BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations that people are born with. These are mutations that you acquire during your lifetime in your tissues. So we call these somatic mutations, and cancer cells have hundreds, if not thousands, of mutations. And those mutations we know were driving the proliferation and the invasion and the, the death in the end that the cancer causes. But we've also known for two decades or more that that's not quite enough. You need something else. And these experiments that spawned this idea actually go back more than 20 years. They go back to the 1950s, the very famous cancer biologist um, was doing experiments on cancer. So what she did was she took a, a mouse. Mouse had a tumor. She took the tumor out of the mouse, chopped up that tumor, grew those cells in culture, got lots of cancer cells. And then she took those cancer cells and put them back into another mouse. Mouse got a tumor, died of cancer, no surprise. But it depended on where she put the tumor. She put the two, if she, where she put the cancer cells. If she put the cancer cells in one tissue, she developed, the mouse developed a tumor, she put them in a different tissue, nothing happened. The mouse was fine. And that was the realization that you need also a tissue microenvironment, an environment of the tissue that allows those mutant cells to go on and form a tumor. So this is an example. Uh, these are human breast cells taken from a human. The red are the nuclei, and the green is a protein that organizes those cells into what we call alveoli. If you section through, this is a culture. If you section through this culture, you'll see something that looks very much like what you see in a human breast. 
So these are normal breast cells, and this is breast cancer. So it's a mess. I mean, you can see the cells are, are disorganized. They're invading this, this tissue culture milieu. This e cadherin is all over the place. The nuclei look ugly. And what was done then was take these cancer cells and trick them using a specific antibody into thinking they were in a different tissue environment. And this is what you get. Looks pretty normal. So these are the kinds of experiments that made us realize that you need two things to form a cancer. Mutations, for sure, but a tissue environment that will allow that cancer to grow. So here's the problem. Some of you may be scratching your head and saying, wait a minute, okay? Mutations accumulate throughout life. Babies have mutations. Embryos have mutations. These mutations start extremely early in life. And what happens is that um, they just accumulate. They get to a certain point um, where eventually you have hundreds, if not thousands. The other thing that happens, everybody here that's over 30, if you've looked in the mirror recently, you know that tissue structure starts to change very early in life, long before you see cancer in the clinic. And so if that's true, that mutations start early, tissue structure degrades early, why is it that we, don't, we, meaning people, don't get cancer until they're in their 50s or 60s? For about half of our lifespan, we're protected from cancer. So the answer to that is because we evolved um, as organisms that had to deal with the cancer problem from the beginning. And so evolution has done a very good job of putting in place mechanisms to prevent cancer for at least that part of our life when we were mostly alive. And we call these collectively tumors, whoops, sorry, tumor suppressor mechanisms. There are probably hundreds of genes that contribute to these mechanisms, but there are two basic mechanisms that suppress the development of cancer in our, um, the first part of our lifespan. So I'm going to argue now that this remarkable protection we have from cancer came at a cost, an evolutionary cost, and that cost is what we call aging. So let me explain why I think this is the case. Very early on, uh, maybe uh, 50 years ago, um, two very famous cancer biologists decided it would be useful to think about tumor suppression as coming in two flavors. And they called these flavors caretakers and gatekeepers. So caretakers are pretty straightforward. These are genes that code for proteins that take care of your genome. That is, they suppress mutations. So they're DNA repair genes, they're antioxidant defense genes, and you can even consider these longevity assurance genes. They help assure our longevity by taking care of our genome. But there's the second class of tumor suppressors, which they call gatekeepers. They're far more complicated. What they do is they determine cell fate. They integrate multiple sensors of what's happening to a cell and then give a cell basically three choices. Live, die, that's called apoptosis, or stop dividing forever, that's called senescence. So these are two very good tumor suppressor mechanisms. A dead cell can't form a tumor, a cell that can't divide can't form a tumor. They work, we know this. We have mouse models, we have some humans with mutations in the genes that cause apoptosis or senescence, they die an early death due to cancer. So we know this is good. But now think about a tissue going on for five or six decades where cells are slowly dying for the purpose of protecting you from cancer. What's going to happen is eventually that tissue will lose its stem cell pools and eventually it'll experience degeneration. And the same thing is true of tissues that are accumulating cells that can't divide. Eventually that tissue will become defective in being able to regenerate and repair. And I'll show you that this process is actually much more complicated than this process. And senescent cells can even change 
um, neighboring cells and cause the entire tissue to fail. So, that's aging. This is precisely what we call aging. So the idea is that the forces that allow us to survive for half of our lifespan pretty tumor-free are the same forces that are driving those phenotypes and pathologies that we call aging. And I want to point out that this idea that there are uh, processes that were selected for early in life but are deleterious later in life is very consistent with major evolutionary theories of aging, in particular one that's called antagonistic pleiotropy. Let me just explain that a little bit better. Um, so imagine you have a cohort of organisms. They could be mice, they could be people. And it starts out, everybody's alive. So these are young, fit adults. And eventually, those, that cohort of organisms will die. And they will reach the point where nobody is alive. So it, during 99.99% of our evolutionary history, um, this occurred in what we call a natural environment, which is high hazards. Infection, predation, not enough food, no control over the climate. So in the case of humans, um, that was much less than 50 years of age. By 50 years of age, everybody was dead. And the same thing is true for mice. Mice out in the wild rarely live beyond six months of age. Now, what's happened is we, Homo sapiens, our species, We've done something amazing. We've taken this natural environment and we've improved it, at least in the developed world. We've conquered infection, we have lots of food, we have protection from the climate. The only predators we have left, so far as I can tell, is ourselves. And so what's happened is we have developed a protected environment. And as a consequence, we're living much longer. And so what evolutionary theory has told us is that if there was something that was very good for you here and very bad for you out here, there was no one alive on which natural selection could act. And therefore, these phenotypes were beyond the force of natural selection. That is, aging has escaped the force of natural selection. And that's the whole idea of antagonistic pleiotropy. Another way to say it, in simple terms, is what's good for you when you're young can be bad for you when you're old. So what I'm going to do is um, hopefully convince you that especially the process of cellular senescence is an example of antagonistic pleiotropy. And it's go I, what I'm going to hope to show you is that this idea that it evolved for the very good purpose of preventing cancer has now come back to haunt us in our older years and is driving age-related diseases. And then I hope I'll cheer you up at the end by saying what we can do about it. So what is cellular senescence? There's a long history of cellular senescence. It was first discovered in the 1960s, but I'm going to pretty much tell you how we think of it now. And we think of it in basically two ways. So the first is it's a stress response. A cell receives some kind of stress. It can be things that are bad for the genome. So oxygen we breathe, the food we eat, um, and ionizing radiation. It can be those mutations that we accumulate when we're very young. Um, but it, it can even be things that disturb our, our metabolism or change our organelles. And these are all stresses, and as a consequence of that stress, the cells stop dividing. And the idea is not to make any more of those stress cells. But we also know that two other things happen when the cells stop dividing. They start to secrete factors outside of themselves, the senescent cells, so that they can affect neighboring cells. And they also now become somewhat resistant to dying, so they're stable. And we think this is why they accumulate with age. So this is one way to think about senescence. But in recent years, there's been a second way that we now think about it, and that is it's a response to physiology that is necessarily beneficial. So for example, we now know that there are certain embryo uh, structures that are initiated by a wave of senescence. And we also know that um, uh, the placenta 
undergoes senescence of certain cells that initiates childbirth. And finally, we know that there are um, senescent cells at the site of damaged tissue, and those senescent cells are making things that help the tissue repair. And most of these activities is due to this secretory phenotype, the secretions of the cells, that, of this, the stuff that the cells are making. So really the way we need to think about senescence is that it's an evolutionary balancing act and that there are good things, suppressing cancer, remodeling and repairing tissue, and then there are the bad things, which is that especially, again, this, the stuff that the cells are secreting can drive aging phenotypes and diseases, including, very ironically, late-life cancer. And I'll show you some data to support that. So I think the way the field is thinking is that we know that this growth arrest is extremely important for suppressing cancer. We, have, we know all the genes that control it. Um, and we want to keep this intact. But we also know that um, this secretory phenotype, can, which is, causes a, a, a condition called inflammation, can be driving many of these aging phenotypes. And so we want to be able to selectively silence this part and preserve this part. And this is a big challenge. This is not easy stuff to do. So let me just tell you that we now can identify senescent cells in human tissue. It's been done now by many, many labs. There are lots and lots of markers that we use to identify senescent cells. I won't go through them all with you. But I will tell you that we also now know that there are no really specific markers. It's another challenge in the field. We have to look at multiple markers in order to understand whether a cell is truly senescent or not. But we have used these markers, and I just want to emphasize one of them, because this is going to become important um, in a little while, is this protein called P16. So P16 is a bona fide fide tumor suppressor. If you lose this gene, if you're born without this gene or a mutation in this gene, you will die of cancer. What it does is it arrests the cell cycle, so it's important for causing the cells to stop dividing. And this is probably the closest we have to a specific marker, although even it is not absolutely um, perfect. But nonetheless, using these markers, we can ask the question, when and where do senescent cells appear? And the answer is twofold. The first is they increase with age. To my knowledge, every vertebrate species that has been examined, there's an increase in senescent cells in multiple tissues, actually every tissue that has been examined. This is human skin, and this is, so this is the outer part, the epidermis, this is the inner part that gives your skin its elasticity. In young skin, they're very rare, and we can detect these cells. This is one of these markers which turns the cells blue. And you can just see in the older skin, there's more of them. But the other place we tend to see senescent cells is at the sites of those diseases I showed you on my first slide. So here are two examples. So we see them in um, non-healing venous ulcers that are present in many diabetics. We see them in atherosclerotic plaques, arthritic joints, etc. Here's an example of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, the major cause of lung failure in the elderly. And this is in the um, pulmonary artery, the a particular cell type called the smooth muscle cells. And you can see that if you look at these arteries, um, this is a normal artery, and this is a patient with COPD. There's always more in the diseased lung. This is an example in the brain. This is uh, from an Alzheimer's patient. Here we see senescent cells present much higher rates than in non-Alzheimer's brains. And here, it's not the neurons that are becoming senescent, but it's a cell type called the astrocytes. Astrocytes, I will remind you, are the cells that give rise to brain cancer. So these cells shut down as a result of stress. They become senescent, and they become much more prevalent during Alzheimer's disease. So you can say, in a way, senescent cells are a smoking gun. They're present at the right time and the right place to be driving multiple age-related diseases. So those of you who are scientists in the lab, especially the students, you should be skeptical, right? Because um, 
First of all, what's the mechanism? We always like, we bi biomedical scientists, we always like to know the mechanism. How could these cells possibly be driving so many different diseases? And secondly, do they really do it? Everything I've told you so far is correlation. Correlation does not prove causality. So, let me first tell you how we think these cells might be driving these very different types of pathology, and then I will try to answer the question, do they, at least in the mouse, and if the answer were not yes, Eric would have told me to stay home in California. All right, so how? So we think this is the key. The secretory phenotype, the cells that the cell, the, the stuff that the cells secrete, um, have the possibility to drive what we call inflammation. Actually, it's been known for years that if you were to take a liver biopsy from, say, a 14-year-old and a 40-year-old, and a pathologist were to look at those biopsies blinded, he or she could tell you who's young and who's old. And they look for two things. One, the structure of the tissue, and two, the presence of low-level infiltrating immune cells, which is the hallmark of inflammation. What those immune cells do is they're making destructive molecules that eventually cause the tissue to degenerate. In fact, uh, Claudio Franceschi, a very famous gerontologist in Italy, coined this term inflammaging. We're all experiencing inflammaging. And we know now that many of the things that the cells secrete have the possibility to drive this inflammaging. We know that inflammation can destroy tissues, it can disrupt tissue function. I'll show you a couple of examples. It can prevent stem cells from acting properly. So stem cell research is, is the wave of the future, but until we control inflammation, those stem cells may not work. And then finally, of course, inflammation greatly increases your risk for developing cancer. Again, very ironic, a tumor suppressor mechanism driving cancer. So let me show you a little bit of data. We, we scientists like to deal with real data um, about this secretory phenotype since it seems to be so uh, important. But I will warn you, it's extremely complicated. Every week, it seems to become more complicated. But let me show you some examples. So this is the first um, description of a kind of inflammatory molecule that is secreted by senescent cells it's called a DAMP. It stands for Damage Associated Molecular Pattern. And it, the founding member of this family, growing family of pro-inflammatory molecules is this protein called HMGB1. It's a major nuclear protein. It sits in the nucleus, binds DNA, um, tells transcription factors when they should or shouldn't bind. And for years, transcription factor people scientists studied this protein for its role in the nucleus. In another life, immunologists were studying this protein because they knew macrophages secreted this protein when it started to drive an inflammatory reaction. When you cut yourself and it turns bright red, that's dams being released from the wound. So what Albert Davalos in the lab showed was that all senescent cells that we've looked at lose this protein from the nucleus and secrete it outside of themselves. So they're acting like pro-inflammatory macrophages. And we know that um, these changes have nothing to do with changes in transcription. It's dependent upon a tumor suppressor called P53. And this discovery was the tip of the iceberg. We now know that senescent cells secrete lots of dams. So that's something that they can do to promote inflammation. The second part of this, of this secretory phenotype is dependent on transcription and doesn't depend on this tumor suppressor P53, and it was discovered by Jean-Philippe Coppe in the lab. And Jean-Philippe was using what's called an antibody array. So basically, it's little blots of um, antibodies on a long strip. The strip actually goes way out here. And you can take um, medium produced by non-senescent and senescent cells. We did this with human cells and put the medium on the strip. 
And then the antibodies would bind proteins that are present in that medium. And then we use tricks and get a computer to display the results like this. Everything that's high is yellow, everything that's low is blue. And you can see the senescent cells have lots more yellow, so they're producing lots more of these different proteins. And these are very different proteins. They're cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, proteases, lots and lots of different stuff. And this fact, these, uh, this family of proteins has actually grown in, in size since we started studying them. Um, we also have, the, yeah, it's grown because we've done a, a technique called mass spectrometry and we know that it's even tenfold more of these proteins that are secreted. So the cells are secreting lots and lots of things that are proteins. But the other thing is they're secreting lipids, small molecules that are present in membrane, usually present in mem membranes. And they secrete two types of lipids, prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And what does this mean? Prostaglandins are, they're actually very complicated lipids. They help resolve wounds. So when your wound that turned red begins to resolve, a group of prostaglandins are mediating that. But it also hurts. And prostaglandins also uh, allow you to experience pain. And the leukotrienes actually start the healing process by producing a, um, a, a, a condition called fibrosis. So I'm not going to show you any more data. We have tons and tons of data, but I'll just tell you that the exact number, or sex, sorry, the exact type of proteins, damps, and lipids that a cell produces depend on the cell type, whether it's a skin cell or a kidney cell. Um, it depends on the timing, that is, it's very dynamic, it changes over time, and it depends on what caused that cell to become senescent to begin with. So it's a very complicated project, uh, problem. But nonetheless, we now have evidence that um, these types of, of uh, qualities can explain a lot of what we see uh, when we look at the presence of senescent cells. So the question is, do all these secretions actually do anything? And the answer to that is also obviously yes. And let me start um, with another example of cells in culture. So these are, again, mammary cells growing in culture. And what these are from a mid-pregnant mouse. So we take those cells, we put them as single cells in a three-dimensional culture. They begin to grow, and then they self-organize into these beautiful alveoli. And here, the red color is milk. We actually can get these cells in culture to make milk, just like a human or mouse breast. And if we embed in these cultures non-senescent cells, we still get these beautiful alveoli, lots of milk. But if we embed in these cultures the senescent cells, we see these very misshapen alveoli and milk production falls. So this argues that the presence of senescent cells can disrupt normal tissue structure and function. Now I told you that the senescent cells, or, or inflammation rather, can suppress stem cell functions. And that's shown here. These are human neural stem cells that we've made from um, embryonic stem cells. And the green here is a measure of their ability to proliferate. It's DNA synthesis. And you can see if we take conditioned medium from non-senescent astrocytes, in this case, we get lots of DNA synthesis. But if we use conditioned medium from senescent astrocytes, like that present in the Alzheimer's brain, um, we get much less proliferation. So something those cells are making is suppressing the ability of those stem cells to proliferate. What is ironic is we've done the same experiment with cancer stem cells, and we get the complete opposite results. That is, the senescent cells are making something that stimulates cancer stem cells, even though it suppresses normal stem cell from proliferating. And the last example I'll show you um, really shocked us when we discovered this. It was discovered by Anna Kratolica in the lab, and then it was followed up by Jean-Philippe Coppe. Anna took breast cancer cells that, sorry, breast cells that were pre-malignant. They weren't fully cancerous, but they weren't fully normal. And so they are looking at tumor volume over time. She puts them into the breast of a mouse, and of course they're pre-malignant, they don't form tumors. 
But if she puts them in with senescent cells, these cells convert to full-blown tumorigenicity. And these are human breast cancer cells put into a mouse breast. And this is what the tumor looks like six weeks later. And this is what it looks like if we co-inject them with senescent cells. So the tumors are larger. They're also, uh, you can see this red, this means they're more vascularized, which means that they have a greater chance to metastasize. So the idea is that with age, we accumulate senescent cells. They make proteins and lipids and dams that cause neighboring cells to fail to function. And this would then cause degeneration. And of course, what really happens, I told you, is we're accumulating mutations all the time. And so if a senescent cell is nearby, you can take a premalignant cell and turn it into a cancer. So if you're not depressed, you weren't paying attention. All right, what do we do about this? So you need this tumor suppressive mechanism. If you don't have it, you die of cancer. If you have it, you die of aging and cancer as well. So we thought of two approaches. We thought, well, one, maybe we could get the cells to stop secreting. And so that approach was, let's find the pathways that cause these secretions and then see if we can find a drug that stops them from secreting. And we were very successful. So we found three major pathways that cause the cells to secrete. And the beauty of these pathways is that they all were studied by big pharma. So the targets were known. And the pharmaceutical industry even had drugs that inhibit every one of these major pathways. So what's wrong with this problem? The problem is, these are really important pathways for maintaining normal tissue function. For example, if I told you we have to kill your DNA damage response pathway in order to prevent your senescent cells from secreting, you would say, no thanks, don't do it. So that's true for all of these pathways. So they're all important for normal tissue homeostasis, so they're not good targets for being constantly suppressed. And the other problem is you do have to suppress them constantly. Because you add the drug, the cell stops secreting. You take away the drug, the cell starts secreting again. That means you have to take the drug all the time. Big Pharma loves that. But I would argue there's no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. So we abandoned this approach from a therapeutic point of view. We're still studying these pathways because the biology is interesting, but it's not a, a very th good therapeutic approach. So the second approach was, what if we get senescent cells to die, to just go away? And we've now been able to do that, and we've been able to do it in a mouse, but we had to do it by making a transgenic mouse. So bear that in mind. This won't work with people yet because we can't make transgenic people. But it works in a mouse. So the idea is, is we take this P16 protein, we take the sequences that turn that gene on and off, and we have that gene now driving a totally artificial gene that has three features. One is it has an a, a enzyme called luciferase, which enables us to measure senescent cells in a living animal by using imaging. Um, it has something called a red fluorescent protein, which allows us to sort senescent cells from tissue. But most importantly, it has this viral uh, enzyme called thymidine kinase, which converts a prodrug called gancyclovir into a very active poison that will eventually poison the mitochondria and cause cells to die. And this protein is not present in the human genome or the mouse genome. It's a totally, um, it's a viral protein. So we can feed a mouse gancyclovir and cause senescent cells to die at any point in its lifespan and whenever we wish. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Here is the luminescence, that is the glowing, where we can measure senescent cells in a living animal. This is a mouse, so before 12 years of age, that's like 30, 35 years of age for people. You don't have to worry, the signal is very low. After that, you have to worry, because the signal just goes up and up and up. And we can eliminate about 80% 
of that signal by giving the animals this drug, gancyclovir. And this is just another one of the markers in visceral fat. There's lots in the old. Gancyclovir eliminates about 80%, very little in the young. Um, I just want to point something out. This is the error that we measure in each of our measurements. And you can see it goes up with age. This is one of the big unknowns in aging, this idea of stochastic variation. That is, genetically identical mice, sometimes raised in the same cage, can show variation in how many senescent cells they have. This is something we don't understand and we're studying. So we have now made these mice and we know we can eliminate senescent cells at any point in the lifespan. Our colleague at the Mayo Clinic, Jan van Dersen, has made a very similar mouse, uses a different killing mechanism, but it's the same thing, a transgene that allows us to kill senescent cells at any point in the lifespan. And we've shared these mice with literally dozens of laboratories. And what those laboratories have done is they each specialize in a different age-related disease. And they used our mice to ask, do senescent cells drive many of those diseases I showed you on that first slide? And the answer even shocked me, and I've been working in this field for so long, how many diseases we now have proof that at least in the mouse, senescent cells are driving that disease. So everything in blue has already been published. Everything in black is in progress, but I've seen much of the data. And you can see that it's pretty amazing. Parkinson's disease, atherosclerosis, cancer metastasis, I'll show you some, uh, one example of that, um, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, etc. So this is now the first proof we've had as a biomedical scientist that senescent cells can drive aging diseases in multiple tissues. I'm going to show you just a couple of examples of work that we've done because this is an interesting problem and gets back to, to where I started my training, which was in cancer biology. So we now have drugs to treat cancer. And many of those drugs are really effective. There are children who would be dead now because they had leukemia or lymphoma, but were treated with, with chemotherapy and their cancers are cured. The problem is these kids are now middle-aged adults and they're showing up in the clinic and they look like they're 20 or 25 years older than they are. This is a big clinical problem. Same problem, by the way, for patients on highly active antiretroviral therapies. So let me show you an example of how we can account now for these side effects of genotoxic chemotherapies by the presence of senescent cells. So here's this glowing I was telling you about, and this is work that was done by Marco Di Maria, um, who now has his own lab in the Netherlands. Um, what he did was he gave the mice a single dose of these different chemotherapeutic drugs, and then he waited three months, six months, as long as a year. Those drugs gave a lifelong burden of senescent cells, which we can measure with this glowing. And we could, he could show then that he could eliminate these, this glowing by giving the animals the drug gancyclovir, the drug that kills senescent cells. So I'll show you now what the cost of having that lifelong burden of senescent cells is after the chemotherapy. And the first has to do with cancer metastasis. So what he did was he took a breast cancer cell line. It's labeled now with a different enzyme that glows. So we're going to follow the, the tumor. And he injected that into the mammary, uh, the inguinal mammary gland of the, of the mouse. And then he asked what happens when he follows the tumor. So the idea is we give the animals breast cancer, we wait for the cancer to grow, then we give them the chemotherapy, in this case doxorubicin, and then a few days later we either kill senescent cells or not. So here's the primary, here's the control animal, here's the primary tumor growing in the, in the breast. So the breasts are very low, in, in the inguinal breast is very low in the mouse. Here's the metastasis to the liver, here's metastasis to the lung. In the cells in which we cleared senescent cells, the primary tumor had variable effects, 
but we completely eliminated the ability of those cells to metastasize. And our hypothesis is it's because the senescent cells are secreting all these molecules that are good for tumor cells to grow, very much like I showed you in those cell culture experiments. Now, what often limits the ability to take the chemotherapy is it's hard on the heart, especially the, these drugs that are like doxorubicin. We can measure that in a mouse. We can measure this by echocardiography. So we collaborated with Simon Meloff at the Bruck Institute, and what we showed is that if we give the animals doxorubicin, we see a decline in heart function. But if we eliminate senescent cells, we can completely prevent that loss of heart function. And the last thing I'll show you is the chemotherapy causes a propensity for blood to clot, which can cause strokes. And we can mimic that in a mouse by just measuring how long it takes when we make a little nick in the tail. So the, the chemotherapy causes a decline in bleeding time, that is more clotting. But if we eliminate senescent cells after the chemotherapy, we can now prevent that pro-clotting phenotype. And I'll just show you one more example of a very different type of disease, which is Parkinson's disease. This is a collaboration with Julie Anderson's lab at the Buck Institute. So she was looking at human autopsy material, patients with Parkinson's disease or normal brains, and she saw these markers of senescent cells elevated in the Parkinson's um, brains. So we went back to the mouse. We can give the mice Parkinson's disease by treating them with this herbicide, Paraquat. It also causes Parkinsonian symptoms in humans. And so what we did is we gave the animals a Paraquat, and we know that the Paraquat causes specifically the astrocytes in the brain to undergo senescence. So I'll just show you the results of the motor neuron function. So if an animal is given paraquat, it hasn't enough motor neuron coordination to stand up in a beaker. This is called a rearing assay. If we then take these paraquat-treated mice and after the paraquat eliminates senescent cells, we can prevent this decline in motor neuron function. So the idea is, is that I think we now have identified a basic aging process that drives multiple age-related diseases in multiple tissues. And the question then is, are we going to be able, at, this is in a mouse, are we going to be able to translate this um, to people? I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip this part on wound healing and just get to the very end. So the idea is, we want to be able to kill senescent cells. We do know that they do good things, and we want to be able to identify those factors. Okay, so none of you are going to be made into transgenics. You want a drug, right? So is it going to be possible to find pharmacological agents that can mimic these transgenes? And the answer is yes. They've already been identified by multiple laboratories. These are called senolytic drugs. They're on the horizon. Some of them are not ready for prime time. None of them are ready for, for common use. But the first of these drugs have now already been given to people in what's called phase one clinical trials. So I think this is really exciting that we're on the cusp of seeing drugs that are going to influence our life, the quality of our life. Certainly, this will increase our health span. What about lifespan? Let's take a vote. How many of you think you start at age 50, we're going to give you a senolytic drug maybe once every five years? Clear out your senescent cells. You'll have lower osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, lower heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Are you going to live longer? How many think they're going to live longer? How many think there'll be no change in lifespan? Wow, 50-50. All right. The experiment was done, at least in mice, never been done in people. This was done by Jan van Dersen. So this was his mouse, and what he did was at around the midpoint of the lifespan, he started giving the animals the drug to kill senescent cells every few months until they died. And he saw this significant increase in median lifespan, average lifespan. No increase in maximum lifespan. Ah. 
So why is that? Okay, so one possibility, something else is killing these animals. We don't know what it is. We have to figure it out. Maybe we can combine it with synolytics and extend lifespan. I think that's not going to be the case for the following reason. You can ask Eric about this. C. elegans, world's record for extending lifespan. Really, these animals, it's possible to extend the lifespan of this little worm tenfold. Pretty amazing, right? So now, let's get a little more complicated organism, the fruit fly. Maybe twofold. And you know what? In a mouse, if you get a 30% increase in lifespan, you're famous. You'll have your name on the New York Times. So it's very possible that when evolution began to um, select for longer and longer lifespans, it had to act on multiple genes, hundreds, maybe thousands of genes, we don't know. And it's very unlikely that we're going to find a single drug that's going to be able to do what evolution has taken hundreds of thousands, if not millions and millions of years to do. So what we can hope for, I think, is to die healthier or to live longer, better and healthier. And I think the, we, the way we should take our lessons from what biomedicine has told us is not from this woman. So this is um, uh, Jeanne Calman. She is the oldest recorded woman, human, in all of mankind. She lived to be 122 in some months. Um, this is what she looked like on her 121st birthday. I don't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to trade shoes with her. I mean, she was blind. She had osteoporosis. She was frail. Um, she was not exactly playing tennis. I think that the person we want to emulate is this guy. Does anybody know who this is? This is Thurgood Marshall. Um, he, for those of you who don't know, he was the first black Supreme Court justice in the U.S. Supreme Court. I'll remind you, this was a lifetime appointment, and this was in the 1960s. And so someone had the nerve to ask him how long he plans to live. And I loved his response, and I think this is what we have to hope for. <laughs> so, I'll thank you for your patience. These are all the great people in the lab. Currently, wonderful group of past collaborators without whom this wouldn't be po possible and past lab members with whom we still collaborate. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Can we, can I, yeah? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So two good questions. So the first question was, what are the phase one trials that are going on now? So they're, the phase one trials are not for chemotherapy-induced um, bad side effects. The phase one trials are for glaucoma, and it, the reason is because you can apply the drug locally, and the other is for osteoarthritis in the knees and the hips, again, a direct injection into the joints. Phase one trials are simply to show that nothing bad happens. Hopefully, I mean, so far nothing bad has happened, um, but hopefully those will continue to be safe, and then there'll be a phase two trial, which will ask for efficacy. Um, the second question was when you take, when you have this burden of senescent cells and you kill them off, does the tissue fall apart because you're, you're getting rid of all these cells, you're causing them to die? And the answer is surprisingly no. So even though that signal looked very bright, we rarely see a tissue with more than say 10% senescent cells. In fact, it's usually only one or 2%. So for reasons we don't understand completely, um, the burden of senescent cells never reaches such a high number that so far we have not seen any deleterious effects of eliminating them all from a mouse, again, from a mouse. The reason why we think they don't pile up to such high levels is because there is a role for the immune system to get rid of those cells. 
but that declines with age as well. So it could be the combination of more cells and less clearance, so eventually they pile up. But you never get tissues that are really filled with senescent cells, so that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, is there a greater chance of an adult getting cancer compared to children? Absolutely. 90% or 85% of cancers that are treated in clinics throughout the developed world are people over the age of 50. Childhood cancer is tragic because you see this young child suffering, and so it receives a lot of press, but it's really quite rare. Do I know why that is? So, <laughs> so there, there are probably three reasons why. The first reason is it does take time to accumulate the right amount of mutations. Um, so a child has to be very unlucky to have the right number of mutations in the right time. Secondly, it takes time for the tissue environment to be conducive. Again, a child would have to be unlucky to have a tissue environment that looks older than it is. And the third is this is my speculation. I mean, I, I'm not the only one. I think there's a, a, a growing consensus in the field that childhood cancers may be somewhat different in the sense that they probably start in embryogenesis. So it's probably something that goes wrong in the embryo, but you don't see it until the child is a few years old or, or maybe even 10 or, or sometimes even in their teens. Yes. Th that's true. Yes. Yes. And and mesenchyme, mesenchyme derived. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not that they're more senescent. By the definition of growth arrest, they're, they all seem to be the same, but it's that secretory phenotype that varies enormously with cell type and, and, and driver, whatever drove the cells into senescence. So we're just beginning to understand the incredible heterogeneity of what we call a senescent cell. And it does seem that some cell types are better able to draw, have an influence on neighboring cells than other cell types. But this is early days, and the dream is to develop drugs that will target the bad, the really bad senescent cells, and you know maybe leave the ones that are sort of benign intact to help with tissue repair and regeneration. Yeah, yes, so what we know is that uh, senescent cells appear at the sites of wounds, and we were even able to sort those cells from wounds in, in mice and identify the factors that drive those cells uh, into a pro-healing phenotype. So the major factor is a factor called platelet-derived growth factor, and it's made primarily by endothelial cells and fibroblasts in the skin wound, and we know that that's important for helping wound healing. The flip side of that is if you have an epithelial cell that ectopically expresses PDGF receptors, the PDGF in that wound can then start driving those epithelial cells to a tumor. So again, it's this, this balance. Yes. Yeah, that is a great question. Yeah, I, I, I will. Uh, the question was, how do we explain the specificity 
for certain, t for certain tissues being much more predisposed to developing cancer, especially with age, you know, breast, prostate, colon, as opposed to, well, those, those, those pediatric tumors. So the short answer is, we really don't know. <laughs> but the longer answer is that we do know that the spectrum of mutations tends to be different between, say, epithelial tumors and mesenchymal tumors and, and even, even some stem cell tumors, some, some very primitive stem cell tumors. Um, and so one of the more fa famous cancer biologists, a guy named Bert Vogelstein, who developed the idea that you need to develop you need to acquire mutations in a certain sequence to drive a cancer. He's now changed his mind. He just published a paper where he said 50% of all cancers is probably just bad luck. And there is, that's again this stochastic component. It just, you just happen to develop this, this mutation in this tumor which is in this microenvironment, et cetera. So there is this stochastic component that we don't understand. We don't know if we'll ever be able to control it. Yes? Who, which? Yeah. Um, we don't know. So, so some people, we haven't done this, but some people have begun to look uh, at centenarians, but they're mostly looking at senescence in the blood, which is very tricky because it depends enormous, what you get out of the blood depends enormously on your past history and present history of infection and, and, and inflammation. Um, it looks as though there's less inflammation and less senescent cells in healthy centenarians. So I should also point out, Claudia Franceschi has made this point repeatedly, there are centenarians that are falling apart. They're just in terrible shape. And then there are centenarians that are healthy and vibrant. And so the centenarians we're interested in when we talk about you know, aging are the healthy centenarians, the ones who really seem to be vibrant. So those people do seem to have less senescent cells. We don't know about other tissues. It's hard to get biopsies from them, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Senescent cells, yes. Jim yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, disatinib and quercetin. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, so let me say a few things about that. First of all, um, my vision, and it's shared by other people in the field, is that whatever senolytics are developed for prime time in people um, should never be taken all the time. These, these are drugs that will be taken intermittently. And it's just for the reason I pointed out. There's really no such thing as a perfectly safe drug. Even water will kill you if you drink too much of it, right? So the idea would be to, to stage the drugs so that they're far enough apart. And the other thing is to shorten the interval in which you take those drugs to a minimal interval. Now, unlike, so disatinib was developed first as an anti-cancer drug. And the thing about cancer is you have to kill every single cancer cell if you want a cure, right? The only good cancer cell is a dead one. That's not true for senescent cells. In our transgenic mouse models, we never kill all the senescent cells. So the idea is, is that you can minimize side effects um, by shortening the interval and lowering the dose. That being said, there are certain t periods of time where you would never want to take a senolytic. You don't want to take it before you have surgery. You wouldn't want to take it if you're pregnant, because I showed you it's required for some structures in the embryo. So there will be constraints on these drugs for sure. No.
No, it's not. It's, is chemotherapy the only way to treat cancer? There are, uh, so the, the big hope of the future is, is immunotherapy, which does not involve the types of drugs that um, I'm talking about. But um, the, the big problem with cancer is just what I said. You have to pretty much get every cancer cell. And even with immunotherapy, um, there are now some surprising side effects that some people are showing. On the other hand, it's made some cancers that were, you know, 99% fatal, um, you know, 50% of people are surviving. So cancer is a tough one. I'll tell you, I'm more optimistic about the degenerative diseases of aging than I am about cancer. I think this is a problem. As long as we're alive and we have dividing cells, it's, it, we're going to have to fight that battle. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, quercetin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my my philosophy is everything in moderation, <laughs> or everything in moderation, <laughs> right? Because um, I mean, even high doses of of some of these nat so-called natural products, we don't know whether they can be harmful or not. The trials have not been done. That's the big problem with natural products, is there's not a lot of hard clinical data about them. So I would stay away from anything at high dose. Um, but you know, on the other hand, taking a low dose of certain supplements, I, I don't see that there's much evidence for harm. I'll tell you though, if you want, if you want to help improve your health, the single most important thing you can do is exercise, and we don't know how it works. Amen. Yeah.